tracing its roots back in 1901 from the then Bureau of Government Laboratories, which became the Bureau of Science, the Department of Science and Technology, Industrial Technology Development Institute, or DOST-ITDI, turned 119 years old on July 1, 2020. From basic researches to mapping of the country's flora and fauna, and other local resources for scientific studies, DOST-ITDI has been a vital instrument in establishing the research and development agenda in the country. It was 1958 when the Bureau of Science became the National Institute of Science and Technology NIST, that industrial R&D started gaining ground while harnessing local resources and skills toward self-sufficiency and optimized productivity. Industrial R&D went full gear in 1987 when the NIST was renamed Industrial Technology Development Institute, focusing on four major functions, research and development, technical services, technology transfer, and custodian of the national units of measure to provide international traceability. DOSD-ITDI research and development covers five major areas. Food, Environment and Biotechnology, Chemicals and Energy, Material Science and Packaging Technology All aimed at supporting and answering the needs of local industries Complementing its R&D are its technical services Standards and Testing National Metrology and Technology Transfer Aimed at harnessing local industries' productivity and competitiveness and translation of developed knowledge or innovation into the production sector, paving the way for new businesses or startups. As well, DOST ITDI innovations serve as springboards for businesses to thrive and prosper. In support of the administration's thrust in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, DOST interventions are anchored on the theme, Agama Teknolohiya, Sandigan ng Kalusugan, Kabuhayan, Kaayusan, at Kinabukasan. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and when most of the country was in enhanced community quarantine, DOST-ITDI bravely rose to the call of duty, distributed ready-to-eat foods such as the Pack of Hope, and mung bean cocoa milk drink to our frontliners in Metro Manila and other regions in the country, produced face shields via 3D printing and donated these to hospital frontliners, developing prototypes and 3D printing critically important parts of hospital equipment and improved design of N95 masks to better protect the frontliners. The Institute is also providing interventions for our displaced countrymen who lost their jobs and livelihood by making training available online whenever necessary. And even before this pandemic, DOSD ITDI innovations were critical in rehabilitating communities that experienced calamities and even war and make them whole again. DOSD ITDI has been preparing for an innovative ecosystem for new knowledge and technology to thrive and help make us ready for Industry 4.0. DOSD ITDI aims to achieve kaayusan and assert in the future or kinabukasan through its initiatives and help businesses in every Filipino adapt to COVID-19 under the new normal. State-of-the-art facilities are being established. Construction of the Simulation Packaging Testing Laboratory SPTL, and Green Packaging Laboratory GPL, is ongoing. At the SPTL, stress conditions that affect products during transport are simulated that can help mitigate losses during distribution. While produced, products can be processed and packed in a green packaging laboratory. AMSIN or the Advanced Manufacturing Center, DOSD's 3D Printing Technology Center, is a joint project with Metals Industry Research and Development Center, MIRDC. ITDI focuses on developing multiple 3D printing materials from local materials to reduce costs. Halal Food Research and Development Facility With this facility in place, the Institute hopes to develop new food products that are compliant to halal standards and as well support DOSD as it responds to Republic Act No. 10817 or the Philippine Halal Export Development and Promotion Act. Enhancement of the competence and capabilities of the National Metrology Laboratory of the Philippines. Expertise and facilities are being upgraded and construction of laboratory facilities for metrology and chemistry and biology are now ongoing. It is envisioned that the animal will provide the country with credible measurements and traceability in the fields of physical, 
chemical and biological metrology. And with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, DOST response has been decisive. With the support of President Duterte and the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases, the DOST will establish the Virology Science and Technology Institute of the Philippines, or VIP, to be constructed at the new Clark Economic Zone in Capas, Tarla. The VIP shall be pursuing priority virology research and developing diagnostic kits, therapeutics, and vaccines for diseases caused by viruses, where DOST ITDI will have a critical function. From laying the groundwork for science and technology in the country, the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology through the
tracing its roots back in 1901 from the then Bureau of Government Laboratories, which became the Bureau of Science, the Department of Science and Technology, Industrial Technology Development Institute, or the OST ITDI, turned 119 years old on July 1, 2020. From basic researches to mapping of the country's flora and fauna, and other local resources for scientific studies, the OST ITDI has been a vital instrument in establishing the research and development agenda in the country. It was 1958 when the Bureau of Science became the National Institute of Science and Technology NIST, that industrial R&D started gaining ground while harnessing local resources and skills towards self-sufficiency and optimized productivity. Industrial R&D went full gear in 1987 when the NIST was renamed was Industrial Technology Development Institute, focusing on four major functions, research and development, technical services, technology transfer, and custodian of the national units of measure to provide international traceability. DOST ITDI research and development covers five major areas. Food, Environment and Biotechnology, Chemicals and Energy, Material Science and Packaging Technology All aimed at supporting and answering the needs of local industries Complementing its R&D are its technical services Standards and Testing National Metrology and Technology Transfer Aimed at harnessing local industries' productivity and competitiveness and translation of developed knowledge or innovation into the production sector, paving the way for new businesses or startups. As well, DOST ITDI innovations serve as springboards for businesses to thrive and prosper. In support of the administration's thrust in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, DOST interventions are anchored on the theme, Aghama Teknolohiya, Sandigan ng Kalusugan, Kabuhayan, Kaayusan, at Kinabukasan. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and when most of the country was in enhanced community quarantine, DOST ITDI bravely rose to the call of duty, distributed ready-to-eat foods such as the Pack of Hope, and Mung Bean Cocoa Milk Drink to our frontliners in Metro Manila and other regions in the country, produced face shields via 3D printing and donated these to hospital frontliners, developing prototypes and 3D printing critically important parts of hospital equipment and improved design of N95 masks to better protect the frontliners. The Institute is also providing interventions for our displaced countrymen who lost their jobs and livelihood by making training available online whenever necessary. And even before this pandemic, DOSD ITDI innovations were critical in rehabilitating communities that experience calamities and even war and make them whole again. DOSD ITDI has been preparing for an innovative ecosystem for new knowledge and technology to thrive and help make us ready for Industry 4.0. DOSD ITDI aims to achieve kaayusan and ascertain the future or kinabukasan through its initiatives and help businesses in every Filipino adapt to COVID-19 under the new normal. State-of-the-art facilities are being established. Construction of the Simulation Packaging Testing Laboratory SPTL, and Green Packaging Laboratory GPL is ongoing. At the SPTL, stress conditions that affect products during transport are simulated that can help mitigate losses during distribution. While produced, products can be processed and packed in a green packaging laboratory. AMSIN or the Advanced Manufacturing Center, DOST's 3D Printing Technology Center, is a joint project with Metals Industry Research and Development Center, MIRDC. ITDI focuses on developing multiple 3D printing materials from local materials to reduce cost. Halal Food Research and Development Facility With this facility in place, the Institute hopes to develop new food products that are compliant to halal standards and as well support DOST as it responds to Republic Act No. 10817 or the Philippine Halal Export Development and Promotion Act. Enhancement of the competence and capabilities of the National Metrology Laboratory of the Philippines Expertise and facilities are being upgraded and construction of laboratory facilities for metrology and chemistry and biology are now ongoing. It is envisioned that the animal will provide the country with credible measurements, 
and traceability in the fields of physical, chemical, and biological metrology. And with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, DOST response has been decisive, with the support of President Duterte and the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases, the DOST will establish the Virology Science and Technology Institute of the Philippines, or VIP, to be constructed at the new Clark Economic Zone in Kapastarlac. The VIP shall be pursuing priority virology research and developing diagnostic kits, therapeutics, and vaccines for diseases caused by viruses, where DOST ITDI will have a critical function. From laying the groundworks for science and technology in the country, the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology, through the years which turned 119 last July, has been consistently providing innovations to industry to help make them competitive, emerging as a credible industry partner. The Institute has been instrumental as well in mitigating hazards improving the lives of disaster victims and communities to rise again. With so much optimism with this cooperation and bridging of talents and expertise, we look forward to enhance science, technology, innovation, competitiveness, and the emergence of new research and development capabilities that hopefully will translate into new products and services that meet the current future needs of our nation and the people. One of the
Um, Doc, I'll meet for you. Sorry, can you hear? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. Yeah, so good morning, uh, UK, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Philippines, and um, good evening, uh, US. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss um, fundamentals in virology and uh, virus culture and purification. So there are many procedures in molecular virology and uh, fundamentals in virology. There's um, virus isolation and uh, purification and protein analysis. Sobrang dame. So in a short span of time, the one one hour lecture. So hindi natin kaya ng discuss lahat. So we we'll just focus mainly on cell culture and virus culture and uh, purification. Okay, I'm start. I'm gonna start my slide. I'm gonna turn off my video. So. Okay, is the slide clear? Um, clear? This. Yeah, okay. So um, I'd like to set the goals and objectives of this lecture for now. So the first one would be the main aim is to have the better understanding of basic virology principles, the principles of virus isolation, culture and uh, purification and other techniques in virology. Second, I need everybody to understand different groups and classification of viruses and increase awareness on virus hazard groups and working in containment. If you want to isolate virus, if you want to culture the virus, we need to understand what the hazard group of that virus is and how to work in containment when you work in a virus. It's a very dangerous thing to work on if you don't understand what you're working on. So I need you to uh, be aware of that and understand the basic steps necessary to collect, transport, store, culture, and propagate, isolate and purify, and visualize the virus. And lastly, I, uh, to understand virus culture isolation, virus growth, harvest, freezing, quantification, RNA extraction, and molecular diagnostic technique. So, um, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Pondo. Uh, yung presentation ko, uh, wala. Oh. Di po atan ang Sorry. Um, uh, is it okay? Yes, no. Okay. Yeah, no, it's okay? Yes, no. All right, okay. So, so I'll just stop my video. Okay, yeah, to focus on the lecture. All right, so I've uh, already said this um, this thing, so I just, uh, if you want to read on it, go over it. Okay. All right, so on the screen, uh, I have a two background here. So one is uh, red colored and one is yellow with blue. So I'll uh, walk you through it. So the one that is in red is a cell infected with coronavirus, okay? So coronavirus is an envelope virus. It it's, um, uh, infects a cell and it exits the cell. What we call exit of the virus is egress. It egress the cell through budding. So it egress the, uh, the budding cells through the philopodia. So in a bacteria, we call it um, uh, flagella. Okay, in the cell we have philopodia, but philopodia is not used by the cell to be motile. They are not motile. They use the philopodia to communicate with other cells in culture. So cells in culture, growing in culture, they need a cell-to-cell -cell contact. So they need to, to, to communicate with other cells in the culture. So sometimes they exchange genetic materials using this philopodia. So this is the philopodia that we see. 
and we see the coronavirus is budding from that pilopodia. And this is the, even a higher magnification on the yellow and blue. The blue one are the viruses that is uh, budding out of the pilopodia, and the pilopodia is the one that is sticking out or the, uh, the, um, that's sticking out from the cell. Okay, so first things first, before we proceed to um, virology, virology laboratory or working on viruses. Do not attempt to handle, isolate, propagate, or manipulate viruses if you don't have the appropriate containment facility. If you have the virus, for example, corona, and you collect the sample, don't attempt to propagate it in a cell culture. You're going to amplify the virus without having no, without knowing how to handle it in, um, uh, and uh, how to contain it is very, very irresponsible. So you have to know the appropriate containment facility and hazard group of that virus before you attempt to culture it or handle it. Next, some virus hazard category changes according to on how you manipulate them. For example, hepatitis B, HIV are hazard group two. But if you culture them, you amplify the virus. Now you are working with millions or trillions copies of virus. It will now become category three, okay? Because the virus on, on in blood or in sample, they don't they don't replicate. They don't replicate in there because that's not there. Um, it's not in 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 the environment that they have to replicate. Like there is no culture medium. There is no carbon dioxide to maintain the pH, so they won't replicate. But if you replicate them and they are amplifying, they now changes the category into higher level. Zika virus, when you handle them in the lab, like in the blood, it's category two. But if you culture them, it will become category three. Okay, learn the basic first. Understand the enemy to have the right weapon to fight them. Okay, we have to understand each virus. What is the virus? What is What constitutes a virus? What covers the virus? What is a capsid? What is an envelope viruses? So, we have to know if the virus that we are handling is an envelope virus because envelope viruses are very labile, very, very, very uh, delicate. They can easily be destroyed by handling or phasing. Or we have to know if the virus that we are handling, for example, you are working with rotaviruses. Rotaviruses are very robust. They, or they don't have envelopes, so they can survive even if it is dry. So we have to understand also the content of the virus, if they are DNA or RNA viruses. So you have to understand the enemy in order to fight the enemy. Okay, in Sagera, kailangan mag-prepare ka. Kailangan maintindihan mo kung ano yung, yung meron ang kalaban para kalabanin mo siya. All right? So I know that uh, many of the Balik scientists already discussed, and me, including me, I've already discussed what a virus is. But I want you to understand deeper. Yeah? A virus is a protein material enclosing a genetic code. So genetic code is inside every virus um, uh, particle, and it's programmed to invade, infect, replicate, make progeny. Replicate means doubling of its genetic material and make a new um, a coating. So you call that progeny or daughter virus, and then destroy or lyse the cell. The virus does, uh, doesn't want to kill the host. They don't want to kill the cell. So intentionally or intentionally, they kill the cell. So for example, um, coronavirus, they don't kill the cell, but in the process of infecting, the cell dies, okay? Other viruses, they, uh, they exit by lysis, so they are lytic. When the virus is lytic, they kill the cells instantly. Bacteriophages are lytic, so when they infect the bacteria, they die, the bacteria dies. So in essence, this is also a good regulator for the bacteria not to multiply, for example, in the ocean. It's full of bacteriophage. The bacteriophage in the ocean in one liter of bacteriophage maybe is more than the total population of the of human in the whole world. But this is essential to control the growth of bacteria in the ocean. Imagine the ocean is full of bacteria. So lalabu yon hindi maganda yung 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 biodiversity. So bacteriophage plays an important role to control that. Okay. So this is an um, example of how the virus. Um, 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 structure is outside of an, there are two kinds of viruses, non-envelope and envelope viruses. Non-envelope doesn't have a membrane or an envelope. This, the membrane is from the host. When it exits the host, 
which is called the egress, it takes up some of the cell membrane into it. So ito yung isang mechanism ng virus to escape immune response from the host. Kasi pag kinuha nila yung part ng, ng cell, ng host, when it enters the host, the host will recognize that um, particle as its own because it has its membrane. Whereas kung non-envelope yan, makarecognize ka agad yan ng, ng host na hindi siya part and then it, the immune response will be activated. So this is part of the strategy of the virus to hijack the cell as well or to enter the cell. So the envelope is part, part membrane, part, part, mem part cell membrane, and part virus. And inside that membrane or the envelope are capsid. The capsid is where, it's, it's where the, the um, genetic material is enclosed. Okay, sometimes the capsid has nucleocapsid in it. The nucleocapsid is a combination of the genetic material which is the nucleic acid and a protein that protects it. So we call that nucleocapsid, okay? In the upper panel, this um, here in the green, the green virus, this is an example of a rotavirus. Rotavirus doesn't have an envelope, but it has two capsids. It has outer capsid. It has three capsid, I am sorry. So the outer, intermediate, and inner capsid. So we call that, we call that in the lab three, triple layer particle. So this triple layer, and then when we remove the outer layer, it's now called double layer particle. I used to study rotavirus before, so I've handled so many of this. So viruses are non-living organisms, remember that, and only replicate inside a living host cell. So it requires, always requires a host cell to, to, to replicate. Not all viruses are harmful. Some help scientists in solving medical problems like bacteriophages are now being developed to control multi-drug resistant bacteria. Or some viruses like adenovirus-like particle they um, use this as a del for delivery of um, some nanoparticles or some um, uh, nucleic acid that will be translated into protein that is helpful for the, for the cell. So all viruses follow the central dogma. The central dogma of life or biology is from DNA, it has to be, the DNA is, replica is replication. So the cell has to replicate and in, order to replicate, it has to replicate the DNA. And then in order to make um, the machinery to replicate that, you need protein. So in order to make the protein is an RNA. So the DNA has to transcribe into RNA. And then the RNA has to make a message, which is now the message to make the protein. The message for the RNA, when the RNA has the message, we call that messenger RNA. So that is the essential part of the RNA because it carries the message to translate a protein. For example, a protein is an insulin. Insulin is carried from the DNA into RNA into protein. The message is the protein, the insulin. In the virus, if the message is capsid, for example, capsid protein, it carries that in a part of the whole genome of the virus. For example, the virus has, uh, let's say the virus of uh, SARS-CoV has 11,000 nucleotides or the virus of um, dengue virus has 10,000 nucleotide, part of that nucleotide or a gene that um, 10,000 are message for um, making a capsid protein. So part, 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 part of that as are um, make into the messenger RNA and then make into a functional protein. The workforce that you'll see here, the workforce is the ribosome. So the ribosome will make all the proteins. So some of the virus, like a positive sense RNA virus, they are already messenger RNA. They don't need DNA. They don't need the DNA to replicate because they don't have a DNA stage. And they don't have even a single stranded RNA. So when a positive sense RNA virus, for example, Zika, HIV, um, not HIV, or, or SARS, very typical SARS-CoV. SARS-CoV is a positive sense RNA virus. When it enters the cell, the genome is already a messenger RNA. So it translates directly and make, make protein and then starts making new virus. It doesn't have to enter the nucleus to replicate. Some viruses, they have to enter the nucleus like, like the adenovirus or herpes virus or human papilloma virus. They have a DNA stage. So they have to replicate inside the nucleus and then go out of the nucleus again to make RNA. So 
oh, to make RNA inside the nucleus, which is transcription. And then the messenger, messenger RNA will go out of the nucleus to be translated. There is no translation of protein inside the nucleus. This all happens in the cytoplasm. Whereas SARS-CoV, they don't have to get into the nucleus because they already have their messenger RNA. So these are the example of DNA viruses and, um, and the uh, structure of it. So there are double-stranded and single-stranded um, DNA viruses, and most of them has to enter a nu the nucleus in order to replicate. Only one has um, uh, in the cytoplasm, which is the pox verite. So when, this, the, when DNA viruses enter, um, infect the cell, they, as I said before, they have to replicate. So replication happens only inside the nucleus. Sometimes they integrate their genome into the genome of onto the uh, genome of the host cell. So, and then the host cell will um, now replicate its own genome together with the genome of the virus. So that's how they do it. That's how they hijack the, the um, cellular mechanism of the cell. Now, RNA viruses, um, it's very simple. They don't need the DNA um, stage. They don't have to, uh, some of them, they don't have to go into the nucleus, but some of them do. So most of them, as opposed to the DNA viruses, most of them stays in the cytoplasm because this is where the, the, the protein is being translated. This is where the ribosome is. This is where the Golgi, Golgi apparatus is. So once the, the, the virus infects the cell, for example, um, Caliciviridae, which is a norovirus or sapovirus, or for example, a, um, a piconaviridae, which is um, uh, foot and mouth disease virus, hepatitis C virus, or encephalomyocarditis virus. When they enter the cell, they disengage, the, the, the capsid disengage, the genome release, they go directly into the ribosome and the translation starts. So infection of a positive sense RNA virus are fast. So it, it, it will double in time or it will replicate in hours. It doesn't need to, it doesn't need much time. And also uh, take note that the positive sense RNA of positive sense RNA viruses are infectious. Even the RNA itself is infectious. You don't need the capsid, you don't need the membrane. You just get the, the nucleic acid, the messenger RNA or the genome of these viruses inside the cell and it will start infection. Okay, so how viruses are classified or categorized? So they are categorized into the nucleic acid that they contain. So it's either um, RNA viruses or DNA viruses. It also categorized according to the coating of the of the of the uh, outer coating or inner coating. It could be an envelope on an envelope, or it could be a um, naked, which only carries the capsid. And also can be categorized into the morphology, which is I, you, sometimes you will hear somebody say it's an icosahedral virus, it's an helical virus, and also from the size, which is like. Typical is a picorna virus, picorna meaning small viruses. And also um, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses proposes this, how to categorize each virus. So in order to categorize it, you categorize it into order, suborder, family, subfamily, genus, subgenus, and species. This is how you categorize it, similar to bacteria, similar to all species. You have to categorize with the order, family, genus, and species. But then there is a simple one, which is um, uh, uh, commonly used now, which is the Baltimore virus classification system. This uh, system relies on how the virus um, make its messenger RNA. So in, in this um, category, the, the viruses are categorized as group one. If they are double-stranded RNA, they have to um, uh, enter the nucleus and make RNA. If they're single-stranded uh, DNA, they are categorized into group two and so on. So you can see here from group one to group seven of, um, of viruses. They are all depend on how they make messenger RNA. So as you can see here uh, in the RNA viruses, single-stranded positive sense RNA virus is group four. It needs to make negative sense. You have to understand this. The positive sense RNA virus, once it 
once it enters the cell, it starts infection. But then when it needs to replicate, it cannot replicate with a positive sense. It needs to make a negative sense. And then from that negative sense, you will, it will use that negative sense as a template using the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase into making a new messenger RNA, which is also its genome. And then package that and then egress or exit the cell. Okay. Now, virus culture procedures. Now, uh, having understand, um, understood the, the, the different kinds of viruses, we are now ready to handle them. So before we handle, we have to understand the virus host uh, relationship, okay? We have to under answer this question. What kind of virus are we isolating or collecting? What are the hazard group? How do we store and transport them? So you have the virus. How do you store them? How do you transport? You might be just after collection, you might just be killing and ended up killing it because you don't know how to store it. How are we going to do um, specimen collection to isolate the material? And once in the lab, once it reaches the lab, what are the hazard group of the virus and working in containment? So you have to know what are the containment level facilities you have in order to work with the virus in the lab. So these are the sample collection PPE of uh, when you collect sample in the field. So when you collect sample from bats, you see the scientists here where they wear the appropriate PPE when they collect samples from the field in, from bats and from pigs, chickens, and also from plants. You might think that you don't need PPE when you sample virus from plants. No, you need PPE because the, the, trans, the transmitter of plant virus are actually human or insect. So when you touch a plant and you touch another plant that is not infected, then you're spreading the virus. So you have to wear appropriate PPE. Okay, for specimen collection and transport system, first is place the specimen in leak-proof, clean, dry container. Use a viral transport medium, VTM, whenever possible. Why VTM? Because VTM is a medium that contains all the nutrients or the, 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 the formulation that the virus needs. The virus will not replicate, but it will make it stable in that solution. The VTM contains the gelatin and antimicrobial agents, so it prevents the, the, the multiplication of uh, bacteria and preserving the virus in there. It is also a buffered solution, so there's, it's not um, uh, acidic. Virus, uh, for information, viruses, they don't like acidic environment. They are usually slightly basic environment. Okay, and also the BTM also prevents uh, specimen drying, it maintains viral viability and deters the growth of the bacteria, as I've said. Okay, now um, uh, BTM should be refrigerated, but you don't freeze at minus 20, never freeze the, 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 the specimens at minus 80 if your end analysis is virus culture. Never, never freeze at minus 20. Why? Because slow freezing creates um, ice crystals, which destroys the membrane of the virus, destroys the membrane of the cell. So that's minus 20. It's a low freezing. But you can freeze them at high temperature. For example, you can freeze them at minus 80 if you have to and mix them with anti-freezing agent. For example, you can mix them with glycerol. So this prevents the formation of ice crystals. And um, next is the transport uh, with or without a cool temperature won't affect antigen and molecular detection. So if your end analysis is molecular detection, for example, you just want to do PCR, you just release the sample right at the source. So it, or the, you just want to analyze the protein. If you, if you carry a lysis reagent, lyse the sample, lyse the virus in there at the source, it's safer to transport it. And then when you reach your destination, the, the nucleic acid, the RNA or DNA is still there and the protein is still there, it's preserved by the lysis reagent. The nucleic acid, which is the, the, the RNA or DNA, this is uh, sensitive to RNA's degradation or DNA's degradation. The RNAs and DNAs are enzymes designed to um, destroy the, the RNAs and DNA viruses. This is designed by nature to destroy the infection. So like, for example, in our skin or in our saliva, it carries an RNAs. 
So when there is an RNA virus that releases the, the genome in there, it will be instantly killed by the RNAs. But in here, in the solution with lysis buffer, the lysis will relax or inactivate the RNAs or DNAs. So the nucleic acid in there are preserved. And do not freeze a specimen for EM, as I've told, that it will destroy the virus structure. I've already said that. And identify and label each super property. We already know this. So, so it's a, it's a, makes sense that we have to identify each uh, and label each tube. So for virus culture and isolation, we will discuss this, the propagation, cell culture, prim what is primary cell culture, what is um, uh, um, infinite cell culture, what are cell lines, primary, finite, immortal, what is, how do you do the freezing and how do you revive when it's frozen? And then isolation of the virus, how do you detect when there is a virus? How do you know there is a virus in your, in your um, cell line? How do you purify that when you already have the virus and um, amplify it? And how do you purify after getting the virus and repurify it through plaque purification? And then how do you titer that? How do you know the, the concentration of the virus, the TCID50 or plaque, plaque assay? And um, uh, how do you infect the virus? This is done by direct infection or through calculation of the multiplicity of infection, which is also called MOI. And uh, important thing to know is how many viruses are needed to form a plaque or infect to start an infection. How many do you need? So you don't know. Later on, we'll see. So what is a cell culture? Cell culture is the removal. This is first part, removal and subsequent culturing of animal or plant under a favorable condition. So when you um, uh, remove, for example, in a mouse, you remove a lung tissue, you macerate the tissue, you slice that, and then you try to culture that into a medium. The cell that will go in, that will settle on the um, uh, culture medium is your primary culture. The primary culture is, um, is, is a finite culture. It has an end. So it only divides up to five or 10 times, and then it will die. Okay, because it's a normal cell, it's not a malignant cell. So it will not divide infinitely. The cells may be removed from the tissue directly and disaggregated by enzymatic or mechanical means before cultivation. You either treat it with trypsin or acutase or any enzyme that will break, break away the, the aggregates of the cells, or you just macerate it or slice it. Or they may be derived from a cell line or cell strain that has already been established. The typical doubling time of cell, mammalian cells, and speaking, is 16 to 18 hours. So you have to be careful when you, when you culture this and every time when you uh, passage a cell or split or divide it. The typical um, uh, doubling time is uh, 16 to 18 hours. So going back to the, the, the picture on the panel, the panel on the um, uh, top, the two panels on the top are BHK21 cells or Vero cells. So Vero cells, this, this two, these two cells in here, they are cells in the cell line taken from a uh, plate. So uh, Vero cells are isolated from kidney epithelia of African green monkey. This, these cells were isolated in 1962. And because they are, they are, they are um, uh, immortal cells, they won't stop dividing. They don't have the normal uh, chromosomes that will control the division of the cell. So they, they don't stop. They just divide and divide and divide. They are malignant cells. So the Vero means verde reno or green kidney. So they are taken from a kidney um, organ of the African green monkey. Below the panel below, it's a BHK21 cell line. This is the most commonly used cell line in, in, in a virus culture. So BHK means baby hamster kidney taken from a 21 clone, 21 of uh, baby hamster Syrian kidney cells. So they are um, isolated in 1961. Imagine that was 1961 and still dividing up to now. So they will not stop dividing. Since then, this cell line, the BHK, has been a laboratory standard for the growth of countless viruses and the study of many biological processes. So you express a viral protein, you use BHK21. You want to uh, do a plaque assay, you use BHK21. There are many laboratories that use BHK21 cells. 
me for uh, myself, I used uh, a lot of BHK, BHK21 when I was um, uh, doing um, research on picornaviruses and plaviviruses and uh, orbiviruses. So what are the types of cells used um, in the cell culture? What are the source? Uh, we are speaking of the source of the cell. So primary culture is when the cells were obtained from tissue. It's either whatever tissue is, um, it's either lungs or kidney or pancreas or skin and cultivated in an artificial environment. This artificial environment is the culture medium. The culture medium uh, contains the growth factor and the nutrients that the cell needs. It doesn't um, contain the nutrients that the virus needs. It doesn't care about the virus because the virus will not eat. It will, it will uh, hijack a cell and the cell needs to eat. So the cell needs an, um, minerals and pH balance. It will die on an acidic environment as well as the virus. And also um, it needs a growth factor which is provided by the serum and it needs a protein source which is provided by the amino acids that you use. Okay, so this um, primary cell culture only divides five to 10 times and that's it, they will die, they are finite, okay? And diploid cell uh, strains, division in culture is similar to the lifespan of the source animal. So if the source animal is fetal, they will divide around 50 and then if the source animal is horses or cows, they will divide about 10. In continuous cell lines, these are cells of a single type that are capable of indefinite propagation. So they will just divide forever. So such immortal cells lines origin from, they originate from cancers, usually from cancer because cancer, the, the chromosomes are, have aberrant chromosomes, they are already are transformed. So they transform into an immortal one. Um, Often they don't, they no longer bear close resemblance to their cell, to their cell of uh, origin. And they, uh, as they undergo many mutations during their prolonged um, culture. So when you culture it, they undergo mutations or changing of the chromosome or, and then they will still be a, uh, for example, BHK21 cells, they will still be that. But then this BHK21 could be different from BHK21 in 1961, because there could be some changes in that genetic material. And uh, the usual indication of these uh, changes is that the cells have lost the specialized morphology and the biochem biochemical abilities that they possess as different cells in vivo. And also this um, continuous cell lines, these um, malignant cells are usually a nuploid in chromosome number, especially if they are in malignant um, uh, origin. So types of cell, we are now speaking of infection. So before it was speaking of the source, now we are speaking of infection on type of cells. There are cells that are permissive. So they allow a virus to circumvent its defenses and replicate. So once the virus infects it, they will just allow it. The virus can uh, replicate freely. The immune system of, the, of the, that cell will not function normally. So the virus will replicate, replicate, and then bud or lyse the cell. There's also susceptible cells. So in order for the virus to infect a cell, it needs a receptor. So the receptor is there, the virus will enter, but then it, can, it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean it will replicate inside because the immune system of that cell could be intact or strong. So the virus is there, it releases nucleic acid, but it cannot replicate because the cell is controlling it. Although it possesses a, um, um, the receptor. So the receptor is the virus that uses to enter the cell. So when it enters the cell, it can, it can or it can be, it can replicate. So a permissive cell is always susceptible cell, but a susceptible could not be a permissive cell. Okay, I hope you understand that. Non-permissive cell is a cell where immune defenses does not allow the virus amplification at all. And resistant, if virus attachment does not happen as no receptor is present, virus can get in and infection does not progress. So restrictive also refers to when the complete repertoire of virus genes necessary for virus replication is not transcribed and translated into viral protein. So some of the, when, when the virus infects the cell, some of the, um, the genes, as I mentioned earlier on, some of the genes like capsid, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, um, nucleoprotein, some of these are not replicated because the cell is inhibiting it. There could be some 
sequences there that the cell is recognizing it, it doesn't replicate, it doesn't uh, express that, um, that gene. So these ty types of cells are called restrictive cells. So we want to culture, we know we should know what the culture, what are the culture requirements. So I mentioned it, the substrate or medium that supplies the essential nutrients, amino acids, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. Okay, I want you to realize these are all requirements for the cell, not for the virus. Growth factors, the hormones, the gas, the O2 and TO2, so you always incubate it at um, uh, 5%, 10%, uh, 5% 5, 5 to 10% CO2. Okay, the CO2 is not for the cell to breathe. They will not breathe because they are in suspended medium. The CO2 is helped to regulate the pH of the medium, which is slightly alkaline, okay? And then the most cells are anchorage dependent and must be cultured while attached to a solid or semi-solid substrate. They are adherent or monolayer culture. So when you see the cell, they will adhere as in here. These are all adherent cells, as you can see in here. They, they stick to the surface of the, of the plates or your um, flask, and they stick there until they divide, until they are confluent. Confluent means they are 100% um, they are 100% covering the surface. They will not grow on top of each other. Just remember it. So they are called monolayer. They're just one layer. Some, they don't grow like on top, on top, on top. They will not form an organ. So they just, they will just be a monolayer. That's why they, I said, I, I've said earlier in the talk, they need cell-to-cell -cell contact. They make cell-to-cell -cell contact through, uh, the, um, through their pilopodia and then they make uh, the, the surface confluent or they just make it full, okay? Uh, others like blood, like blood culture, like lymphocytes, sometimes you need lymphocytes in order to, to experiment with, for example, HIV, you need CD4 cells. So these are lymphocytes. They will not stick to the surface because they are not adherent cells. So they are suspension cells. So they, they need to be in suspension culture. So the requirement for temperature for mammalian cells is always um, 35, 37 degrees, 35 to 37 degrees. If these are um, mammalian cells, if these are insect cells, they are always a room temperature. Insect, they don't grow at 37 or 35. Okay, these are examples of the cell lines that um, some viruses uses to culture. So herpes simplex will need Vero hep 2 um, and then um, BZB, which is varicella zoster virus, you, you, will, you will need HEL or HEC. CMV, you will need uh, diploid fibroblast and so on. So you can uh, go over it and read it. So the cells are um, uh, named after the clone and the source. So for example, Vero is um, from the African monkey. Uh, as I've said, it's, its uh, uh, origin is called v, Vero, v, Verdarino. Verdarino means green, green kidney. And BHK, for example, BHK, they said BHK. It's uh, BHK based baby hamster kidney cells. So those are the abbreviations. Okay, one of the most famous cells in culture is our uh, mm. HeLa cells. Mm. So HeLa cells are from a lady or a, um, a woman in, an, uh, um, in 1950s who suffered from cervical cancer. So this is one of the most famous cell used in propagation of virus. It's an epithelioid carcinoma derived from carcinoma of the cervix. And the age of the cell at that time is 31 year old. Now, because the cell is dividing infinitely, there's no age because there's, there's no stopping from cell division. The first established, this is the first established epithelioid cell line from human isolated in the early 1950s. It is now widely used in research and have helped in medical research in, in all uh, kinds of viruses. If you have viruses, you test it for human, you need HeLa cells. So usually when you need human cells, you just think of HeLa cells because most of the cells that we use in the lab are animal or mammalian cells. Human cells, the first uh, um, propagated was HeLa cells. And interestingly, HeLa cells are the most common contaminant 
in the cell lines in the lab. So when they, um, when they realize, sometimes scientists, they work on their virus and infect a cell, and they don't realize their cells are contaminated with HeLa. And because HeLa, HeLa cells, they just divide. They just divide. They, they are resistant to, to some of the factors that inhibit other cells. So they just divide. Sometimes they overtake the original cell line. And before you knew it, you are working with HeLa cells already. So you don't, you lost already your, for example, is mixed with uh, BHK cells. You already lost your BHK because it's overtaken it. And now you're working with HeLa cells because HeLa cells are most common contaminant in the lab. But then it's also most reliable. It's also one of the most commonly used uh, cells for virus culture. So subculturing, okay, we are now, know what are the types of cells and what are the cell lines and we grow it for example we grow it and then we have a confluent cell so this is as you can see these are HeLa cells this when you say this this is the population of the cell in your plate you want to infect it and you want to know the confluency confluency means the number of the cells um, in the in the mid in the in the adherent to the cells that is stuck stuck to the to the ad, ad, stuck to the to the plate to the flask or plate. So, for example, in the panel in the middle panel here, I would say this is um, sixty percent confluency, sixty percent because it has not covered all the surface. Okay, so when you check in the microscope, you want to infect. You don't infect at sixty percent confluency because at sixty percent confluency the virus will infect all the cells and it will not let it um, um, uh, replicate or multiply. So it will just infect it and the cell will stop uh, multiplication. So you usually infect the virus at uh, 80% or 90% when you want to do, for example, plaque assay or virus amplification. So at the right panel, I would say this is 90% confluency. Once all the, all the um, Surface are covered, for example, I'll show you this one or this or this. These are 100%, all of these three are 100% confluency. So they are 100% because all the surface had been covered. You see there, they will just stick to each other, but they don't grow on top of each other. Yeah. So these are 100% confluency. When they reach 100% confluency, you need to split them passage them or subculture them. So we call that subculturing, passaging, or splitting cells. Okay, when a particular cell line reaches confluency, passaging is necessary. Otherwise it will reach like until it is so stuck to each other, they will die because there is no more surface to grow. They will not stop dividing, but there will be no more space. They will eat up their nutrients, they will die. So maintaining a log phase growth will maximize the number of healthy cells for your experiment. So when you subculture, take note that it has to be subcultured or passage or split on a log phase. They are actively dividing. It's not just adherent to each other. So you passage a cell when they are 95% or 90% confluent. They are still dividing actively. You uh, do that by using an enzymatic method, which is the trypsin, acutase, and serum. So trypsin and acutase, they will uh, make the cells detach from the surface of this, um, of this uh, um, flask. So this flask, they grow on the surface. The surface of this flask, which is specially designed, these flasks are specially designed for culturing cells because the surface is, is uh, a bit rough for the cells to attach to it. It's not very, very smooth. So the cells will attach to that. And then the purpose of the trypsin and acutase is to detach the cells from there. And then, then you can resuspend it and make um, resuspension of your cell solution. And then the trypsin, the cells doesn't like trypsin because they it, it hurts them. So what you need to neutralize the trypsin after detaching them are, is the serum. So the serum will neutralize the action of the trypsin, which is an enzyme, and then you can now passage it and transfer it to another. This one, this um, here, is now making a um, suspension and then we'll passage it or split it into a new medium like this, and then it will be um, put in the incubator on a um, uh, horizontally, not vertically, like this.
Okay, we have already discussed the media that is needed and the CO2 incubator and the purpose of the CO2. Okay, the Dublin time is 16 to 18. So when you passage, you have to calculate your, 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 your passaging. So for example, your 100% confluent um, uh, T150, this T150, 75, 25, these numbers corresponds to a square centimeter area of the flask. So T25, T25 means 25 centimeter square um, area, 25 square, uh, square centimeter area of this small flask. 75 means 75 um, uh, square centimeter area of this flask. If you have, for example, 25 full confluency, it's confluency is full and the doubling time is uh, 16 to 28 hours. You divide this into two. So this one, you passage it, make this suspension and divide it into two. Tomorrow, these two will be 100% because the doubling time is 18 hour. If you want to passage, so you will need to passage it again tomorrow, right? If you don't want to passage every time, like every day, you want to passage every other day, you have to passage it at 25%. So 25% means one four. So instead of distributing it into two flasks, you distribute it into four flasks. So four flasks means it's now 25% confluency today and the doubling time is 18 hours. So tomorrow it will double, it will become 50. And the next day, it, all the four will become 100%. So for today, uh, Wednesday, we want it on Friday 100%. We divide it into four. And then on Friday, it will be 100%. So take note of that. So if you want a cell to divide, for example, in five days, full confluency in five days, you divide it into 110. So 110, yeah? Okay, so these are the other methods or um, guidelines for passaging um, uh, or detaching the cells. So there are many other methods. You can just um, scrape it. If the cell lines are delicate, they are sensitive to trypsin, you just scrape it and then resuspend it. Or trypsin plus collagenase, um, uh, if you have a high density cultures or cultures that have poor multiple layers, especially fibroblasts, they overtake each other. And then this space, if they are detaching epidermal cells as confluent and then intact sheets from the surface of culture disease without dissociating the cells. So these are the methods. Now, um, if you want an exact number of your cells before uh, passaging or splitting, you have to count it in, the, uh, in a counting chamber, counting chamber we call hemocytometer. So hemocytometer is, um, um, is a small glass, uh, like a slide that the, we use for counting cells, either blood or, or mammalian cells or whatever kind of cells. So the method is you, you have your, your suspended cells in, in, in your medium, you suspended, <clears throat> sorry. After detaching, you have the cells resuspended in the medium and you want to count the cells before passaging. What you do is you add, you get 10 microliter from that suspension, 10 microliter. You add 10 microliter of your type and blue. So your <clears throat> dilution now there is one to two, okay? Because 10 microliter of type and blue and 10 microliter of cells. And then place it in the, in the chamber you place the cover slide here and then place it in the chamber, load it in this side and on that side, and then count four edges, four edges. So in uh, hematology, we call this WBC squares. The central is the RBC squares. So you count it on the four edges of the WBC squares or four edges. These four, you count them, count the total divided by four, okay? Now, when you divide it by four, multiply by 10,000, you have the number of your cells and divide by two because your original um, uh, ratio or dilution is one to two because you mix type and blue, type and blue to your cells. So divide by two to get the number of your cells per mil, per ml. So from this, you work on, if you want, for example, an MOI of virus to infect 5,000 cells, you need 5,000 cells. That's an exact number. You need to count it. 
because you have an exact number of your virus. The exact number of the virus is called multiplicity of infection, which is MOI. So now you have your cells. You have, you have already propagated your cells. You counted them. And then you want to preserve some of them. And some of them, you would just want to continue. So in order to preserve, there are guidelines to do this. So the first thing you remember is freeze slow, so fast. OK, there's a reason for this. Freeze slow, so fast prevents the formation of ice crystals. Ice crystals destroys the cell and destroys the virus. It destroys the bacteria as well. Anything that has membrane, Will, this, will be destroyed by ice crystal. Imagine a sharp ice crystal will destroy all of this. So for freezing, you, you already trypsinize, you trypsinize or scrape your cells to suspend in undiluted serum. There is no medium in here. So if you want to freeze your cells, you resuspend it only in pure serum, no DMEM. The DMEM is the medium. So you add the, the, uh, the undiluted serum on your resuspended cells and add the MSO. The DMSO is called dimethyl sulfoxide. Dimethyl sulfoxide prevents the formation of crystals, ice crystals, and uh, prevents the damage on the cells during, um, during the, the freezing, and then mix it. So it should be 10%, the DMSO should be 10% of the total volume of your cells. So how would you do the, how would you do the resuspension in serum? For example, you added uh, in your T175, which is a big flask, T175, 175 square meter, a uh, square centimeter, you have uh, added one mil of your trypsin, and then you you detach the cells, you resuspended it, you add four ml of serum in there to neutralize the, the action of the trypsin. So now you have serum and trypsin and your cells mixed. So that's five mil. So 10% of that is 500 microliter, so 500 microliter of DMSO should, should be added. And then mix it, don't vortex, don't centrifuge, just mix gently because those cells are living. You don't vortex them, you don't destroy the, um, the cell membrane, especially when DMSO is there. DMSO is also toxic to cells. Some of the cells will die in the presence of DMSO, but you still have your cells living, some of them. So after that, you freeze the cell slowly. So you place this in a um, container with, a, like, uh, with an isopropanol, liquid isopropanol, in the minus 80 freezer. So the isopropanol will not freeze in minus 80. So, but the cells that you will put in there will freeze slowly. You will see that when you do this. So then transfer after, like, uh, after the cell has been frozen. So the cell will freeze slowly, slowly, slowly decrease the temperature. After like three days or 72 hours in, in the minus 80, then you transfer it into the liquid nitrogen for long storage. Okay, in the figure you see here that cell suspension at 37, you want to freeze very slow, it will form crystals, and then rapid cooling, it will also form crystal, and the, the intermediate cooling is better. So for towing, it's the same thing. Uh, freeze uh, um, so slowly, uh, so, so fast, sorry. You have to so fast. So how do you do this? As soon as you get the, the cells from the liquid nitrogen, you see that's still frozen, frozen, very, very solid, frozen. Immediately place it in the 37 degree water bath until it is stalled. Don't wait any, 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 any moment. Don't waste any moment like, um, uh, leaving it at uh, room temperature because, because it will also thaw at room temperature. But then if you thaw it slowly, room temperature, ice crystal will form, the cell will die. So you don't have the cell. So then after that, prepare the media, transfer the vial into a laminar flow hood, always work um, aseptic. And then before opening, wipe the outside of the vial with 70% ethanol. And then you now transfer your vial of your of your culture to the uh, um, culture media with 10% uh, FCS. Sometimes uh, when I was working with this, I don't use any more 10% FCS. I don't add serum because the cell has serum in it. It is suspended in serum before you freeze it. Depends on how you freeze the cell. Some, some scientists, they, they mix 50% serum, 50% DMEM, but I use pure serum. So when I thaw it, 
I don't add the FCS and it's more stable in pure serum. So let's go now to virus culture. So virus culture is also called replication, amplification, propagation, or culture. Okay. I'm just to have a water break, sorry. So these um, words, like these terms, replication, amplification, propagation, and culture often used interchangeably. So, but there are um, um, uh, differences in here. Uh, so you want the culture and propagate a virus for them to replicate and amplify. It's like that. So amplification is the multiplication of the virus. Replication is the replication of the genome. Propagation is when you uh, grow them or culture, when you grow them on the culture media, okay? So viruses replicate only within living cells. Remember that, okay? We already know that, but um, sometimes we forget. Virus cell tropism plays an important role. So what is virus cell tropism? Sometimes the virus infects this host, these cells, and then it will mutate or it will adapt to another type of cell line. So for now, with, for now, for example, for today, it infects HeLa cells. And then for later on, when you try to infect like uh, BHK or MDCK or Vero, it doesn't in the, in the first few days. And then it starts to, it starts to um, uh, infect it because virus tropism has happened. It's already adapted to that cell line and then it infects it. And then research work involving in viral culture is carried out in cell culture. How many virus do we need? We only need one viable virion to start an infection. So in the cell, if you have one viable virion and this is a cell successfully, it releases its genome, it will make many virus progeny in there if it is viable at the start. Okay, so culture has also the potential to detect unsuspected multiple or even novel viruses. So remember in the, at the start of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, um, they isolated the, the SARS-CoV uh, virus and then they cultured that. That's considered novel that time. Last year it was novel. So they cultured that. In order to get the genetic material, you have to propagate and amplify the virus. So they have to culture it, but you don't know yet. You don't know yet which um, um, type of cell line it will grow. So it's a guessing game, but then you know that it is SARS. So you know it's a coronavirus and you know that coronavirus will grow on Vero, Vero cells E6. So they will, yeah, will try first on that cell line and then it will grow, then bingo, it grows. But then if it doesn't grow on that cell line, then you have to go, uh, go to another cell line. It will delay the process, but then you have to. If you remember the, um, the um, uh, movie in the movie Contagion, this uh, virus that was um, um, uh, spreading, they don't, they cannot grow it because they don't know what cell line it grows to. And then there's one scientist in the movie that tried to grow the virus and eventually he discovered which cell line it grows. So it's like that. that so it doesn't mean that, well, this virus will grow into this cell line. So you have to discover which cell line. Uh, this is speaking of the permissivity and the susceptibility and the restrictedness of the cells, okay? There are also other methods of starting infections. So you don't, uh, you cannot, um, uh, there's, it's not only like infecting a cell with a virus. You can also, as I've said, messenger RNA, uh, positive sense viruses can infect the cells even without the intact virion, without the capsid, without the membrane. You just need the nucleic acid. You just need the nucleic acid to enter the cell and start translation, making the, the, the coating of the cells and replicate its genome and then make new virus because it's already messenger RNA. It starts immediately, it will go to the ribosome. So types of virus infection in cell culture. So this is the virus host cell interaction. There are viruses that are cytocidal. They kill the cells. So these are examples, Zika, polio, enterorotavirus. They are lytic, they kill the cells. 
So most productive infections are called cytocyte or cytolytic because they kill the host. So it's not intentional, but it's how they, they, they replicate. It's how they egress the cell. They cannot egress by budding because they don't have the membrane. They have to egress the cell by rupturing the cell. So in the process, it, the cell is dead. The cell, so they kill the cell. This is called lysis. So this, the, the, the virus is cytolytic. So it's also abortive. So abortive infection of non-permissive cells yields no infectious progeny virus. So because you infected a non-permissive cell, the virus will just lie in there and then that thing will happen. There's also persistent infection. This could happen with the, with the VZV, the varicella zoster, CMV. These are the family of herpes viruses and also HIV and measles. So the virus or its genome resides in some or all of the cells without killing most of them. Some viruses have the ability to remain in specific cells for long periods of time. They live in the, for example, herpes viruses, CMV or VZB, or they live in the neurons, the, neuro, the, the neuron cells. Or sometimes they can even integrate their genomes into the genomes of the cell. So this is the transforming infection. These are characteristic of the papilloma virus, human T lymphocytic virus one and HCV. Infection in which the virus does not kill the cell but produces genetic, biochemical, physiologic and morphologic changes that may result in acquisition of malignant properties. So we all know that hepatitis C causes uh, liver cancer, human papilloma virus can cause uh, cervical cancer and wart, which is uh, another malignancy on the skin and human t lymphocytic virus can cause um, uh, cancer. Okay, so how does the virus spread to other cells in culture? So in this um, uh, particular slide, we are discussing here how the virus is spread in culture, in the, in the virus culture, not in the environment or person to person. Okay, so they spread by diffusion. For example, you have a plate, you have a plate there, of your uh, virus culture, there is one cell that has a virus growing, and then there is this, that cell will, will rupture, it will burst, and then will release the virus. The virus are not motile, they will not move, they will stay there, but by diffusion, they will move to other cells, and then that starts the infection. Or they also spread by surface detention and cell to cell adhesion, it's like this. So, that's, as I've said, Cell to cell, cell, cell needs to communicate with other cells. So they call this cell communication through the pilopodia or through cell to cell adhesion. And then the virus is also spread by that. And uh, uh, cell to cell adhesion and also polarization is another method. So the virus um, uh, um, congregate on the pole of the cell and then spread to another cell. So in here, you can see here, it's spread by cell to cell adhesion or it spreads by the philopodia. These are the philopodia, this, this, this um, structure here. So they can spread by that in cell culture. And how the virus, that is how the virus um, spreads. And this is how the virus enters the cell in culture. So the virus can enter the cell by an endocytic pathway. This is what we call endocytosis. This is the, through the endocytic route. There's just an endosome inside the cell. So the virus enter the cells through the receptor and then it will be endocytosed through many uh, ways by micropinocytosis, clotin dependent, clotin mediated, caviolar, cholesterol dependent, or this, or, or dynamin. They will be incorporated into the endosome. So at the endosome, there are enzymes in there, so they will lyse the virus, but then the genetic material is still there. So they will not lyse it, and then they will start a new um, infection. They can also uh, um, uh, enter the cell through fusion to the cell membrane, like this in, in this um, um, panel. So this is an electron micrograph of how the virus exit or egress the cell and spread so you can see here the pilopodia is full of the coronavirus in there. And here, these two cells in here, they have this pilopodia communicating with each other, but then in the process, they are also spreading the virus. You see here. And this is the pilopodia communicating with another pilopodia there. So this is a cell with full of pilopodia. 
And this is the cell full of um, uh, egressing virus on the surface. It's amazing how they, uh, they do this, isn't it? To take the photo in the electron microscopy. Okay, so I've, I've um, mentioned that um, we, un we can also start um, infection without using a virus. This is what we call a transfection. So transfection is getting the viral nucleic acid inside the cell. So any cell can be infected and the, the any cell can be infected by a virus, but can be infected without the virus? Yes. So by starting with the virus genetic material. So the process known as transfection or electroporation. So if you do the transfection, you need a transfection reagent, which is a lipofectin. This is a fat globule. It's a fat globule and it attaches to the cell because the fat globule is positive, uh, positive um, uh, polarity. So the positive polarity will attract the nucleic acid of the virus or any, any genetic material, and then will get inside it because the DNA or RNA has negative polarity. So positive, negative will attract and then will go, the, the, the nucleic acid will go inside there. So it's there. Now, because the lipo, lipo, um, uh, uh, the fat globule, that fat globule is still positive and the cell membrane has negative, uh, negative charge. Cell membrane is usually negative charge. It will now stick to the cell membrane and through the process of endocytosis, it will be taken inside and then that will be um, incorporated into endosomes like most endocytosis are and uh, genetic material will be released. If that genetic material is a positive strand messenger RNA, it will start translation in the ribosome, Golgi apparatus make a new virus. Okay, so this genetic material will not just um, be translated. It's not uh, that easy. It will not be translated into protein. You need to start it. The ribosome needs to recognize something in the nucleic acid. And this is what you call a cap, cap uh, structure in the nucleic acid. This is the mesyl uh, structure in the, in, the, um, in the nucleic acid. So if they recognize this, they will start translation. If the cell doesn't have this, they will not grab that nucleic acid and translation will not happen. So some, uh, some scientists, we design, or when we do transfection, we put a cap structure or we put an IRS structure. IRS is a uh, structure or a conformity, RNA conformity in the um, tertiary structure on the, on the pipe prime end of the RNA to start translation without the cap. This is another way the virus can circumvent the cap structure. So they like have this IRS structure. IRS is internal ribo ribosome, IRS, internal ribosome entry site. So the ribosome will just grab the, the nucleic acid even without the cap structure because of this special structure that the virus has uh, uh, um, geniusly invented for them to grab the ribosome to start the translation. Okay, you also good, uh, need a good transfection agent and a good ratio with the nucleic acid material. So good ratio means do not overload your um, fat globules with so much DNA or RNA, otherwise the polarity will change. It will, if it changes to negative because there's so much nucleic acid material in there, it will not stick to the cell. It will not stick to the cell membrane, okay? So take this as say, um, um, as an idea, like our vaccine, like Pfizer, remember the Pfizer is an RNA vaccine. So they need this fat globule. Remember they have to, they have to mix. The vaccine is RNA, the, the SARS-CoV vaccine is RNA, and then they mix it with the reagent. So they cannot freeze that. They have to be in the, in the um, uh, fridge temperature. So, the, the DNA, the RNA can be frozen, but the fat globules cannot be frozen. Okay, it will destroy it. So they combine that. And then after like 15 minutes, the RNA vaccine will get into that fat globule, will get inside, and then it will be injected into your arm. 
So you, because your arm has cells and the cell membrane is negatively charged, that fat globules with the RNA vaccine will get inside and then the RNA will be released, make into a SARS-CoV protein that is immunogenic. So that's how the RNA virus, uh, the RNA vaccine works. So uh, this process is uh, sometimes called virus rescue or virus recovery because there is no virus here. We don't use any virus. When I was uh, studying my uh, PhD in, in Spain, uh, my um, PI or my um, a project investigator told me, okay, let's start an infection. I was thinking because it's foot and mouth, this is virus. Okay, I'm gonna handle a virus. And then he said, okay, we're just gonna do, we're just gonna transfect this the, uh, RNA. I did not know, I did not know then because I was just a student. So I said, where did, and then the following day, because it's fast. Picona virus infection is like you know, after step, after 24 hours, it will start. I saw plaque. I asked her, where did we get the virus? We did not infect this with the virus. Where, how come this is infected? But this is, this is transfection, he said. And this transfection doesn't need the virus. You just need the messenger RNA. I said, oh, really? So that's how you do it. You just need a sequence, make the sequence into a DNA plasmid, transcribe that plasmid into RNA, and then RNA, make a messenger RNA, in the lab, these are all happening in the lab, and then get that messenger RNA inside the cell, and voila, you have a virus. That's how easy it is. Okay, we also call sometimes reverse genetics. This is also a process of transfection. So the reverse genetic is studying the phenotype of the virus after manipulating the genetic material before infection and observe the expressed phenotype during infection. So usually, what we are doing when we infect a virus, uh, when, we, when we infect a cell is forward genetics. We infect first, observe the cell on what are the phenotypes expressed by the virus, and then analyze the viral genome, what is causing the cell to become like this. Let's find the genome like this. This is forward genetics, okay? When we design a genome, for example, we remove that gene or we mutate that gene and then that gene or the whole, uh, the whole uh, RNA that with the mutated gene is put back into the cell and then create a virus and then observe the phenotype. This is called reverse genetics because we did not start with the virus. We started with the genetic material that is mutated to observe the, um, to observe the, the phenotype or the effect on cells. So this is what I was doing when I was in um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So these are, for example, these are the RNAs that I transcribed from the DNA. The, originally, you, you get the RNA from the virus. So these are the 11 RNAs of your, uh, the RNA of your rotavirus. And then you, this is a Brutang virus now. So it's a similar virus. It's a member of the orbivirus and the virus. So you have expressed your messenger RNA from this uh, virus. So this is just RNA. So we get that from the plasmid. So transcribe that, and then you have your messenger RNA. You check that RNA if they are expressing proteins, if they are translated. So you check that, for example, this big, this one here. This one here is the biggest segment, which is 4,000 nucleotide, will be translated into viral protein one, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You have to check if your RNA is translated into protein before you transfect it. Otherwise, it will not be functional and you will just be waiting for nothing. So uh, um, ch uh, check if it is translated or converted into protein and then converted into protein, functional protein of the virus, which is the, 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 uh, the polymerase of the virus. And then you will see, and then you can now proceed to your um, reverse genetics or transfection. And after a while, you will see that there is a CPE. So the CPE is here rounding up, pyknosis, and death of the cell. That means the virus is there killing the cells. Okay, now you have this, you have the virus, you need to visualize it. So uh, how to visualize the viruses, the culture, this is the cytopathic effect. We call it cytopathic effect, and then plaque formation. And then we quantify that into uh, you doing the plaque assay. And also there is this, what we call quantile assay, which is the TCID 50. We can also do confocal fluorescent microscopy, as you can see here. 
uh, we designed a virus. We have a, um, a virus that has a fluorescent protein. So that virus expressing a fluorescent protein, and we can just see it under the microscope, fluorescent microscope, that the, uh, the fluorescing structure here are the, the uh, virus infected cells. The normal cells are here and the virus infected cells are here. So it's spreading now. This is a 72 hour post infection. Or you can label a protein. For example, this is a protein labeled. And then the blue one are the nucleus and the cells here are the infected one. So this is stained with a fluorescent um, a dye. Okay. And you analyze that, quantify that using facts. And you can also, of course, do uh, quantification or visualization during uh, using the electron microscope. Or you can do quantification of the virus using RT-PCR, which is measuring the nucleic acid content of the virus. But it doesn't measure the, the living, the, uh, doesn't measure the dying, the dying, um, the dead virus or the dying virus or the defective um, interfering virus. It just measures the presence of nucleic acid, whether it comes from the defective interferent virus or the dead virus or the living virus. It doesn't measure, the RT-PCR doesn't measure infectivity. The one that measures, <clears throat> sorry, the one, the assay that measures infectivity is a plaque assay or quantile assay, which is a TIC, TCID 50, these two. So before we infect, we need MOI. MOI means multiplicity of infection. You cannot just infect if you need a, um, a um, exact number of the virus to infect the cells. So if you have, for example, if you want to start a virus infection that starts low and then observe the phenotype on the cell, you start with a very low number of the virus. For example, if you have 1 million cells, you, only, you, will, you want to infect it with MOI1, which is for me is quite high, you need 1 million virus. So if you have uh, 1 million cells and you want to infect it with MOI 0.01, you need 10,000 virus. So you will have to calculate that. So the formula is the PFU over the number of cells or number of cells times MOI is equal to PFU. So this is the, um, how you um, uh, calculate the number of the MOI. Okay, so for example, you, you, you have a PFU of 10 to the seven virus and your number of 10 to seven virus, or like, for example, let's make it easier, 1 million 10 to the six virus. And then the number of cells is 1 million. So you have MOI of one because 1 million over 1 million is one. Or you have the number of cells, for example, 1 million and you want MOI of one. So multiply that by one. That is the number of plaque forming units that you need for the virus. The virus concentration is always measured in plaque forming units. We'll discuss that later in plaque assay. So it does not mean that the number of the virus that the cell receives, it does not mean that in the infection, when you infect with MOI1, it doesn't mean one cell in the whole population will receive each virus. So one cell will receive each cell. It doesn't mean like that. It could be like one cell will receive 1,000 virus and one cell doesn't receive, 1,000 cells doesn't receive anything. So because it's infection, one virus could be attractive to one cell and one virus could not be attracted to one. And because it's in suspension, it goes everywhere. So uh, high MOI start normally gives rise to a defective interfering virus. So usually start with low MOI when you are doing um, experiment with observing a phenotype. So um, another um, method of uh, seeing a, uh, a virus growing on the media is the um, uh, observance of a cytopathic effect. The cytopathic effect is the visible development of morphological changes in monolayer or host cells that leads to cell damage. So what are the cytopathic effects? Sometimes when the virus is starting to be infected by this, when the cell is started to be infected by the virus, it changes morphologically. So it rounds up. So it be, from being an adherent and fibroblast shape, it will round up and then starts to die or it will uh, suffer from pycnosis. It will become small and then it will burst. So in here, this is um, virus infected cells with 
already burst and some are rounded up. So these are all virus infected. This is like, I would say 100% uh, infection. So you say 100% infection. These cells rounded up are already infected and these are the burst cells. So there are cells here that are still attached. This could, this could be the, what I'm saying are restrictive cells. They don't permit the infection. Okay. So another. Okay, what are the types of CPE that we can observe? First is the total destruction of the cell structure. So this is one, one type of CPE, as you can see here, there are, the cells has burst already. It's sliced, it's because this, the virus is lytic. And um, next is subtotal destruction. Okay. It shows some detachment, but not all of the cells are lysed and not all the cells are detached. So it's just subtotal destruction. Or there, there could be a focal degeneration. Cells initially become enlarged, rounded, and refractile, then eventually detached from the growth surface, leaving cleared areas surrounded by rounded up cells at the infections, uh, as the infection spreads concent concentrically. So they form fo uh, foci. So these foci are like, they just spread and they just change in the um, uh, um, uh, shape, but they don't lice. So this, you call this foci. So they are refractile when you pass by the light, they, are, they don't um, transmit the light. So they, the light don't, don't, doesn't pass through them because they are dying. There are some morphological changes, so they, are, they reflect the light. There are also some CPE that you can observe as swelling and clumping, which is, you can see here, clumping of the cells. And also swelling that the, so the host cell, the, the cells can become uh, enlarged, like, like this. Yeah. Another one is the foamy degeneration, that's vacualiz vacualization of the cells. So vacualization is visible only after staining. So you have to stain your cells in order to see the vacualization. And the forming of sexitia. So syncytia are the um, fusing of the cells, as you can see here. Um, these are the syncytia um, from the RSV, RSV infected cells, the respiratory syncytia virus, RSV. So they usually cause the cells to form syncytia or group together or fuse together. And you can also observe inclusion bodies from the cells, so inclusion bodies Inclusion bodies are usually the viral factories inside the cells. So when you visualize some inclusion bodies inside the cells, these are where the virus are congregate, con they congregate in here and they create a, um, uh, a protein aggregate and become the factory of the virus inside the cell. We call this inclusion bodies. Okay, these are examples of the virus and their effects on cells. The lytic virus are shown, and cell fusion, herpes virus, paramyxo, and minimal um, effect. They don't usually instantly kill the host because they want the host to continually producing the virus or replicating the virus. Some of the um, uh, typical of this is the corona because they just bud out from the cell. They don't kill it, and um, some influenza viruses. Okay, now another one is the, um, how, do you, how do you know that there is a um, uh, virus infection? You will observe a plaque in the cell, in the cell mo uh, monolayer. So um, plaque is an area of the cell in the monolayer which displays a cytopathic effect. This is, it is, in this panel here, these are normal cells. There are no virus infected cell in there. When the virus infects the cell, as I said, it will suffer from pycnosis, rounding up, and then it will be lysed. So they will form a plaque. Plaque is a local population of the virus in there. 
and it will be confined in there if you put a um, retarding uh, or or a retarding um, gel. It's a uh, agarose gel in there. So um, uh, the plaque, the inside, the inside of the plaque is clear because the cells in there have already been lysed. So it will spread because the, the virus, as I've said before, the virus is spread by cell to cell contact. So it will spread. So you can you 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 prevent the, the spread of the virus into the solution and to pre prevent it by diffusion by putting an agarose on top of the by putting agarose on top of the monolayer. So when you I will discuss that later when you um, do the plaque assay you overlay it with agar so to stop the flow of solution to stop the flow of virus from one plaque to another. Okay, when this plaque is complete, it will be look like this. So this is a clearing of the of the cells. So one virus is only only one virus is needed to start a infection. So an infection could be started in one cell, and then when it grows day by day, hour by hour, it will grow and it will become a plaque. So this one plaque here could be have like billions of trillions of copies of virus now, but started from one. So this is started from one clone of virus. This is very good for plaque verification because you can just pick this and start a new infection. You pick this plaque verification process, I will discuss later. So these are the example of the plaque. These are example of plaques from Orbi virus. And these are not all plaques are the same. Some, some plaques, they form a comet shaped plaque. So they, 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 the, the, the virus spread is like this. Some virus spread is like circle. So they are not all the same. So this is plaque assay. So it's Delbeco who developed the assay in 1952. So he started it with bacteriophage. So since then it became standard in the um, quantification of and the quantification of the um, of, uh, of virus in the in the infection infected solution. So you do this by uh, making a series of tenfold dilution of a virus suspension, and then you inoculate this into the monolayer, and then leave that the virus to adhere into the monolayer for one hour, and then you now um, uh, have the virus absorbed in there, and then you put the mono, uh, you put the, the melted agar. The agarose that is melted is usually mixed with a medium. Don't put just a melted agarose because the cell needs to be nourished. So the melted agarose has the medium and the growth factor in there and the, and the amino acids. It's all complete, but it's just mixed with the agarose gel and it's overlaid. So what is the procedure? So you make a dilution of the virus first and then uh, you seed your cells into 80% confluency on the day of the plaque. So for example, I want to do the plaque assay tomorrow. You will seed the day, you will seed your cell at 40% confluency today, 40%, because tomorrow it will become 80. It will almost cover, it will almost cover this, the, the, the plate. You don't want to do a plaque assay with a 100% confluency, otherwise you will see very small plaque. Because uh, when you infect the cells, the virus will still, the uh, uninfected or infected the cells, they will still try to divide. So those non-infected cells will still divide, will make the 80% into 90% or 100% the day after. So if you start with 100% and you start with a plaque assay of very, very low dilution, then you will see your cells overcrowded with no plaques at all or very small plaques. Okay, on the day you wash your plate with, uh, with three times of the DMEM. DMEM is the medium without any, without any media. You don't use serum in washing. You don't want, you do not want um, uh, the money layer with a serum because the serum will adhere or, or, or um, bind with your virus and then the virus will not bind to your cells. So you don't want serum in when you wash it or when you do plaque assay. Although the serum is a fetal cap serum, it's assumed that the fetal cap serum doesn't have the, any antibodies. Uh, 
but then it could have antibodies from the mother because the mother shares blood with the baby, isn't it? So, so the the um, immunoglobulin G can cross the placenta. So some of the fecal fetal cap serum have IgG against the virus that you are um, that you are trying to do analysis with. So if you're testing with, for example, um, uh, animal virus like African swine fever. And then the 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 animal has the animal the cup the source of the serum is from that animal who suffered from this disease or for example from blue tongue virus which is the host is a cow, so the baby will have IgG to this. So when you try to infect it, the 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 serum will just um, block your virus from from adhering to your monolayer cells. So uh, how to make dilutions? You make dilutions of your um, virus with uh, starting with 900 microliter of the medium without any serum and then add virus stack 100 and then make a serial dilution of it. Serial dilution from negative one to negative five to negative six, negative seven. Okay, and then add 100 microliter of that into your plate. So 100 microliter from one ml and then add to your plate incubate for one hour and then put a monolayer of agar and medium and then observe for the plaque after that you count your plaque after for example um, 72 hours you observe that the plaques are good enough size to be stained by a crystal violet and then to good enough size to be uh, seen by the naked eye as you can see here now you count it Count again. Count the, um, uh, the from the lower, from the highest to the lowest. So this is the highest. Usually, when I do a plaque assay, I don't count from the highest because I don't, I don't, I don't care about the highest one. I usually start from the from the lowest that I can count. For example, this and this. If this is the ten to minus six. Dilution, 10 to the minus six dilution, and I have 20, for example, 20 plaques in here, and it's 10 to the minus six dilution. Your count is now 20 times 10 to the six. That is your PFU. The PFU of the virus is 20 times 10 times 10 to the six. You remove the, the minus back because that's your dilution. Because you only put 100 microliter from one mil, you increase that into one fold again. So it's now 20 times 10 to the seven because you did not put, you did not add one mil, you only add one tenth of it. So you have to adjust the factor. So 20 times 10 to the seven. And because it's 20, and usually the plaque forming unit, you don't say 20, you say two. So it's two times 10 to the eight. That's the final concentration or number of the virus in your stock. So the number of the virus originally you counted is 20, times 10 to the sixth dilution because it's one tenth of the volume. Now it's 20 times 10 to the seven. And because it's 20, you want it single number, single digits, two times 10 to the eight. That's your final. Okay, now let's practice. Um, tell me the final titer in here, 10 to the five minus six. You can just type your message. give you like one minute. It's not that difficult. I added 100 microliter from one mil, and then this is the final plaque assay. 100 microliter was added. You can type. Nobody's answering. Okay, I will count. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So I can see six plaques in here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is six times ten to the six. This is the PFU. This is the number of the the plaque that I. That's the number of virus that I have in my original. Uh, there's somebody who said six times 10 to the seven, that's correct. So because the dilution is 110, you now adjust it. 
the final count is six times 10 to the seven. So correct, congratulations to Lindsay Susie. So that's how you do the plaque assay. Now, if you want a faster one, you don't care about the plaque because plaque, sometimes plaque assay are, are, are um, very um, laborious and tedious and counting it will, it's, it's very uh, annoying. You can do quantile assay, which is called uh, TCID 50. The TCID 50, when you do this, this is the second type of the infectivity assay that is not quantitative, but it's quantile. You, meaning you don't care about the, the, the counting of the plaques. You just care about the number of the wells or the cells that were infected. And then you count that as one. For example, in here, all of these are infected. So all of them have died. You count them 10, 10. That is the CPE 10, 10, okay? The positivity is one, so 100%. So you are after TCID 50, you are after 50%, okay? Being this being an all or none assay, it is not as precise as the quantitative because you don't count the plaque, you just count. You are only after which one are infected, just, just the, the cell that are infected, that not the, the exact number of the plaque. Divided dilution are the same. So it's just the same as you, want, as you would do in a viral plaque assay. And then after the period of incubation, for example, three days, 72 hours after infection, you count now the CPE. At the end point, you are only after the one that has 50% um, of the wells that were um, observed CPE. So you could record that, for example, this is not 50%, it's still 10, or it's nine. So because there is one here that survived, so that's 90%, nine over 10. In here, you have three. So your endpoint is this one, the three. You could have this two, but the endpoint is three because it already reached our 50%. So you say three over 10, point three, but you record also this one, point two, and then record everything. And then there is a formula in statistical procedure that we will use to calculate this. I will not discuss it here because it's a long one. You need to do it in Excel sheet and then it will give you the final number, which is the TCID. You report it as TCID 50, yeah? So to convert the TCID 50 into plaque forming units, you multiply it by 0.69 and then you will get plaque forming units. Like, like as if you did a plaque assay. So now you have your virus, you have your plaque, you want to purify that because one plaque equals one virus. That one virus is a clone. So it's a pure clone. So it's not a mix of anything. It's just one virus. So you want to analyze, you want to characterize that virus using only one population of virus. So you want this. So you have to plaque purify it. So plaque purification is used extensively in virologists to establish clonal virus stocks. If you want to stock one kind of virus clone in your uh, stock. Okay, when a single um, virus particle can form a plaque, the viral progeny within the plaque are clones. So many of these, the virus here are clones of this one plaque, of one virus. So the virus that prepared from that is called purified virus stock because you already purified it through plaque purification technique. To prepare such virus, the tip of the small pipette is inserted into the agar overlay above the plaque. So you have the small pipette of like, for example, 10 microliter pipette, and you have the agar overlay. Don't do this in the, um, in the flask because you cannot um, insert the, the tip of the pipette, the 10 microliter. You use um, six well plate in here, and then you choose one plaque, for example, an isolated plaque. Don't choose a plaque that is near to each other like this one. This is not a clone of one plaque. This is a merging of two plaques, or this is a merging of two plaques. And don't choose this one because when you pick this through your pipette tip, your 10 microliter tip, you might, um, you might touch this, you might touch this, you might touch this. So you just pick one well that is far, with the plaque far from each other, for example, this one. So pick this through your pipette tip, get that, uh, aspirate, aspirate. You don't need the liquid, there's no liquid there, just 
aspirate that and the agar that is in there and the few cells will have your virus population to start your virus stock from. So uh, when you resuspend that into a medium and then culture that into a new cell line, your fresh cell line, then you will have your pure virus purified, uh, a plaque purified by um, a virus. Okay, there's another one that um, uh, with a, uh, another way of uh, purifying virus is um, ultra centrifugation. So I was doing ultra centrifugation when I was working with the virus, and this is one of the tubes. So the virus, when they congregate, they form a pink white circle. So this is it, and um, this is the the purified virus. we doing ultra centrifugation. Ultra centrifugation is. Um, I will provide you a huge number of virus. You can use this for antigen preparation, for monoclonal antibody production, for virus stock, or for analysis of the protein of your virus, because you need a, um, a pure protein analysis from the virus. Because sometimes when you get, just get your virus from culture, you will, still, you will also get a um, protein from the cell from the host cell that is attached in there. When you do a ultra centrifugation, all the, all the um, uh, molecules will separate according to size. So this in this tube, you will see this is the top of the tube. You will see another ring there, another ring here, and another ring here. So these are the cell debris because they are, they are in there. They are lighter than your virus. They will settle there. And this is a lighter part. And then the heavier part, which is the whole viral genome, which is the triple layer particle will be settled, will settle near the bottom. You don't want, when you do ultra centrifugation um, and you want an intact virus, you don't want the virus to settle into the pellet. It will destroy your virus and it's difficult to, to remove the aggregate of the virus. So, you use a uh, solution here that will uh, have the same density as your virus, which, uh, for example, cesium chloride or a uh, sucrose solution, um, gradient uh, sucrose solution. So gradient means it changes by percentage from the upper to the lower part. So it could be like 100%, 80% uh, sucrose here going to 20%. So the molecules will move according to their um, uh, um, specific gravity and uh, density according to the concentration of your, of your media, for example, sucrose or cesium chloride. So electron microscopy is another one to uh, visualize your virus. So virus diagnosis by electron microscopy relies on the detection and identification of virus on the basis of their characteristic and morphology. So you have to know what is the appearance of your virus. For example, you do your electron microscopy and you saw a virus, but you don't know how your virus appears. Is, does it have a spike? Does it have a membrane? Does it have like this? Is it a naked virus? Is it, is it an envelope virus? For example, this is a rotavirus. It doesn't have a membrane, but it has a capsid. It's a naked one. So you need to identify that and know the virus by heart when you do electron microscopy. You have the ability to visualize the virus and speed because as soon as the specimen comes, you can subject it into electron microscopy and you can see the virus. And uh, the main disadvantage of this is the inability to examine multiple specimens coincidentally. So you cannot examine multiple one. And um, uh, you need a high concentration of the virus. Uh, remember that electron microscopy will, um, will magnify your object million times, so thousand times, million times. So if you don't, if you have a very, very few concentration of your virus, you will not, chances are you will not see it. You will need a very high concentration of your virus. And it's expensive and it requires maintenance, which is also expensive. So this is another way of um, detecting the virus. Another way is, um, which we don't have much time, is examining the protein expressed in the media. You examine the quantity of the protein and maybe we require another um, a session for this. And another way is um, measuring the amount of the nucleic acid that the virus is replicating. So this is another way of measuring an actively replicating virus. So when the nucleic acid is increasing every time, you know that the virus is actively replicating, but you do this by RT-PCR. If this is a um, 
RNA dependent uh, RNA, RNA viruses. So they uh, you will have to do RT PCR because this is rab, um, reverse transcriptase. They have to be converted into cDNA and then to RNA again. Okay, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. So I'm ready for your question if you have some. And if you have some question that cannot be entertained, this is my email, my NHS email and my personal email. So yeah, uh, I, have, I want to use my personal email because at work, I don't want to use um, my email for other uses other than work, but you can email as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Pardo, for that very informative presentation. So, yeah, that ends our learning session for the fundamental laboratory techniques and practices, virus cell culture and verification. So at this point, we are open for your questions. So our, for, for our participants, please key in your questions in our chat box in the Zoom meeting room. And our, for our audiences in Facebook and YouTube live stream, they also type in their questions in the comment section so that our moderators can pick them up and answer by the bar. Okay, so for questions here in Zoom from UP, um, from Michelle Cabanatan of UPNIH. Um, how many number of passages for the subculture before the viral isolation proper? Okay, uh, depends on the cell line that you are using. If you are using a primary cell line, which has a very limited number of passage, you can start your um, virus infection at the earliest passage possible because it will die after like 10 passages. This is primary. If you are using a... Um, uh, uh, continuous cell line, which are the infinite cell line that continues the passaging every time, for example, HeLa or BHK, they don't have limits. So if you have a fresh stock of cell line, then you can throw it and then passage it for number, like passage after three. If you're talking about after sowing, so you sow it, passage three to for the, for the cell to recover, then after passage three or four, you can infect it but the cell will continue dividing anyway. This is, this, uh, the number of passage doesn't matter, but you, maybe you're talking about after sowing. Okay, um, for a second question, uh, question from Ling Li Sushi of BOSKI PDI. For downstream analysis, especially for integrating viruses, does the accumulation of genotypic changes or mutations in the cell line really affects the virus host cell host relationship or interaction. It will uh, affect if the mutation is, um, for example, it creates um, the inf uh, defective interfering virus. So this defective interfering virus will affect your real viruses because it will now uh, block the infection it will just um, block infection of your uh, viable virus because this inter defective interfering virus will uh, have um, advantage of infecting the, the host cell over the other virus because they can replicate faster. They have shorter genome and because they are defective, they can uh, um, um, make a new replicates very, very fast and block, block that uh, cell. So you cannot observe any uh, genotypic um, changes in there. So this mutation will, you don't want this mutation to happen. So for, for, for this mutation to not happen or to avoid this, you can actually start with a low MOI. So don't start with a very, very high MOI virus. Okay, so for another question from Dr. Lotus M. Balala of BSU. Is there, is there some kind of enrichment protocol for viruses to, to say uh, revive weak or stressed virus before they are inoculated in cell cultures? Uh, when, you, when you revive the virus, um, when you revive it and they grow, 
well, that is the that is the uh, um, indication that it has already um, recovered. You say it's stressed or weak because it's frozen or it was uh, subjected to extremes of temperature. But when you revive it into a cell culture and they grow, then that's the start of the virus recovery. And then you can start from that. Um, another question from Michelle, Michelle Cabanagan. Uh, for transport of tissues for viral isolation from one is institution to another, is it okay if it, if it will be submerged in cell culture media like Neiman or VTM is more okay to use? If it is already in, in cell culture, so you have already, you are already um, culturing the virus or for transport, let me review the question. So transport of tissues from one institution to another. Oh, tissue. So um, you can use uh, DMEM or you can use BTM, but tissue, like how big is the tissue? I don't know if it will, um, like a piece of skin or a piece of an organ, then you can just transfer the organ itself. But then if it is a like um, a cell, like for example, a swab or, or a piece, very, very small piece, you can use the BTM. So, um, yeah, um, another question from JP, this man of the USAPDI. So, um, what would you suggest as the best and easiest way to screen temperate patches? Can we also use block formation assay? Also, for the quantal assay, was that successful? So um, for the for the pages, you can use um, black assay. Yes, black formation assay. You can use that, and then um, you can screen by using the black assay. And um, for the quantal assay, I don't know if you can use if there are ways to use the um, the pages for for quantal assay. This is usually for for mammalian viruses. So because you observe the destruction of the whole cells in the in the solution so for tcid 50. okay so for another question from kimberly neri of the oci um do btms contain glycerol or do we need to add glycerol for the longer storage of samples in negative 18 research ultimate filter the B, yeah, BTM, um, I'm not uh, familiar if they contain glycerol because they are not supposed to be frozen, isn't it? The BTM are supposed to be processed immediately after you, um, after, after the, the, the BTM arrive in the lab, you process it, and then you add the anti-freezing agent, that is glycerol or DMSO. So... If it contains DMS uh, glycerol, it will be um, uh, viscous. But um, usually it doesn't contain uh, glycerol, but it contains all the necessary um, materials. For example, gelatin, it contains that. They may add a bit of glycerol to prevent um, uh, uh, destruction to the virus. Depends on the manufacturer. Could be glycerol, could be gelatin, but all other components should be there. Okay, um, another question from Michelle. How to carry out cell rupture? Cell rupture, uh, you can carry out by lysing, uh, mixing it with a lysing uh, solution, for example, uh, lysis buffer. So when you um, mix it with a lysis buffer, for example, SDS or Triton X, you carry out cell rupture. Are you, if you, she's talking about um, mammalian cells, it can be easily ruptured by by a, um, a Triton X, but SDS would be more, more, more harsh. It will rupture everything. So you can carry this out. Okay, the so uh, freezing and thawing, you can do that also. Yeah, the cell rupture by freezing. If you don't want to add anything to the cells, freezing and thawing will also do cell rupture. Yes. Okay, so for in the interest of time, we're ending the Q&A session now. So for the re remaining questions, kung may upcoming questions pa po, so uh, kindly 
ayun, send our uh, send your uh, questions to Doc Parker this evening. Ayun, so and now yes, I'm not sure to And now to present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker, may I call on Dr. Annabel Vibriones, Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute. Hello, Dr. Ted. Hello. <laughs> Kindly flash on the screen our certificate. Okay, so uh, Republic of the Philippines, Department of Science and Technology, Industrial Technology Development Institute, uh, this certificate present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Chodoro M. Fajardo Jr., Balik Scientist, NHS England, Royal London Hospital, for sharing his expertise as resource person for the webinar entitled Fundamental Laboratory Techniques and Practices in Virology, Viral Culture and Purification as part of the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines VIP program of the Department of Science and Technology held online on October 28, 2021 via Zoom, given this 28th day of October 21, signed yours truly. Thank you, Dr. Thank Ted. you. Thank you, Po. Yeah, we have a very good number of uh, participants. Participants, yeah. Yes. Yes. I can see. Yes. yes. They're interested. They are interested in virus culture. I hope yes. they are not confused. It's so long to discuss and so short of time. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't yeah. know if they get The topic everything. is very uh, informative. Yeah, it's, this is very intense. You know, <laughs> for some, if they have not handled virus before, so it's, it's an intense it's topic. A challenge. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you, Dr. Ted. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you to the participants and to Albert, the, the moderator, the host. Okay, um, and now to formally end our webinar this afternoon, let us hear from Engineer Ray Elstera, the Chief of the Environment and Biotechnology Division. Uh, good. Is it good morning or good, good morning? <laughs> good morning. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, aside from thanking you for be for being uh, again our uh, resource person in this uh, webinar series, uh, I'd also like to thank you personally for sending that uh, inspirational message dur during the inauguration of our BSL <laughs> lab. Uh, BSL2 laboratory last week. Yeah. Uh, uh, we truly appreciated your sending that message to us. Thank you. Now, of course, uh, I guess the what we lack in this webinar is well, eventually, hopefully, we could do an actual lab practice. Yes. Of, of yes. what was lectured by uh, <laughs> Dr. Ted. So, uh, well, hopefully, very very soon this will be over and. Uh, We'll, we'll get to see you back in the Philippines. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, supposedly, Doc Ted is our Balik scientist, but he has come back only through our webinar series <laughs> and uh, some of our online meetings. But maybe, I, I hope so, very, very near that uh, we could see each other personally and you could really supervise us in some of the activities that uh, the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines program is, is undertaking. Then I'd also like to thank, of course, Albert for, uh, our, for moderating today's session and our colleagues from CED, uh, Chemicals and Energy Division, Technological Services Division, and uh, Planning and Management Information System Division for helping us putting up this uh, webinar for, and I think this is this is your third, uh, third time, doctor. Third na I, I lost count. <laughs> I lost count. <laughs> okay, so and of course, thank you to our. Uh, when I logged in, there were about two hundred twenty-seven participants, and uh, well, previously we've we've gone down lower than two hundred, but this time we. We again broke the 200 mark. So, 
And uh, I do hope that everyone could still join us in the future webinar series that we have that would run until April 2022. With that, again, good morning, Dr. Ted. Good afternoon to the rest of the participants from uh, the Philippines. And of course, to our beloved director, good afternoon, po, <laughs> and uh, to my co at the Environment and Biotechnology Division. So, maraming salamat po at ingat po tayong lahat. Thank you, Engineer Ray. Thank, Thank you, you po. Thank you, Engineer. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Dr. Ted. Bye po. See you. Okay. See you. Okay. okay. So, at this point, we would, we would like to request our participants to turn on your cameras for our photo op. Our right, photo op. Okay. Okay, so for the first panel, okay, smile, smile everyone. So one, two, three. Okay, next. Okay, smile. One, two, three. Okay, next panel. Okay, I guess. Wala na po nang bukas ng kanilang camera. So, I guess that's it. Okay, so... Yeah, so this this concludes our one-day webinar. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Pardo. And thank all you, our distinguished guests. And of course, for all of our participants for today. And uh, please answer this evaluation form. Flash on your screens to secure a copy of your certificates. And... And this has been Albert Abad of the OSP ITDISVAP program. Do like and follow the Environment and Biotechnology Division ITDI Facebook page for announcements regarding the future. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>
Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging I'm